What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Cup of Jen. My name is Janessa Galbraith, and I am your host. I wanted to just say a quick hello, check in with you guys, see how you're doing. I know that things have started to change. Businesses have opened up. Life has continued on past the season of COVID. We still have a lot of uh, turmoil out there in the world. It could be quite challenging in some ways. So I just wanted to encourage you to know that if you're having trouble adjusting or anything like that, you're not alone. It's not weird. Especially for us as artists, we're going to have a little bit of a hard time kind of going back into what we do. So let's just try to breathe and take it one step at a time if we can and just know that the art and the, the voice that we have is actually very important and valuable. Now, on another note, um, I try to be as transparent as I can on the show, and I think it's good for you all to know that my dad is actually getting a test today, and it's not a great, great feeling, but he's getting a test to see whether or not he might have cancer. Um, my family tries not to live in fear and we don't have any confirmation yet. That's why we're getting the test done. But I just wanted to let you guys know that some of that was going on because, um, I do believe that this is a space where people come to gain inspiration and also, uh, pray. And so I just wanted to let you guys know authentically where I'm at today. Uh, if, you think of him, please, please pray for Lindsay Galbraith, my dad. He's an amazing man, and cancer is not something we really want to deal with if we can help it. So pray for him this morning if you are thinking of it. And uh, yeah, so that's just being real, being honest about what's going on in my life. But what we try to do here is inspire and encourage and give you the tools that you need to continue to go out into the world and make a difference creatively. And so I'm excited that we have Karen Elgrisma on the show today. Karen is an award-winning writer and journalist and overall storyteller. She worked for Shaw Television for 20 years, and in 2014, she went back to school to get her master's and graduated with distinction from Royal Roads University. Her thesis was actually on the power of local storytelling, and she's going to talk a little bit about that in the show. But I think that there is literally nobody better to have talking to us today than Karen. I just think she's very inspiring and I could really talk about her and her journey all day, but I think better than that, we should just let her speak her piece. But before I do that, I wanted to let you guys know that this is actually a two-part episode. We talked about so many amazing things that I honestly just couldn't fit it into one episode. Part one is what you're going to hear today, and part two will come next week, so look out for that. So now I'm just going to play the clip from Karen Elgrisma Media, otherwise known as Chem, and I'm going to let Karen introduce herself. So here's Karen. I love stories. I always have. From the time I was a little girl, I would devour books. My grandmother was a great storyteller, and she would make stories up about her childhood growing up on a farm in Saskatchewan. And she always added in sort of this sort of magical element where the animals would come to life. And she was also very funny. And I would just beg her when I'd go to her house to tell me yet another story. When I was in grade five, I had to write a book report on the country of Argentina. Now this was before the internet, so I had to use an encyclopedia, which was dead boring. And I was sitting at the kitchen table complaining and plagiarizing, and my mom said, why don't you go across the street and interview our neighbor, Dr. Bizualdo? He is born and raised in Argentina, and he can tell you about it. And of course, wanting to avoid homework, I skipped across the street to talk to my neighbor. and. I sat down with him and during the two or three hours that we spent together, I was mesmerized. And I came home and I said to my mom, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to interview people and I want to share their stories. Hello, Cheers, Karen. Everyone. Hello, <laughs> Janessa. <laughs> oh man, it's exciting to have you here because for so many reasons, I mean, you've started your own business, you're an inspirational woman as is, you're basically the white Oprah. It's a big deal. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> 
Yeah. So thank you so much for coming and being on the show with me. Um, I want to ask you what you're drinking for cup of gin. I am drinking, I'm drinking water in a, in a pink cup. So this pink wine glass makes me feel like I'm drinking rosé, but because I'm at the office, um, there's no rosé in the office today, although often there is. I like to keep ah. Seco in the fridge or rosé, but today it's water in the rosé. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. But it, feel, it, feels, it feels sexier in a glass. Than it was <laughs> to have your water. Yeah. I know. It's so funny. Of all of my guests so far, and I've now I think your guest 16 or 17 I I just was banking on you being the one who could have wine with me at like two in the afternoon but that's okay you're at the office we're we're close we're living it it I'm is having, I'm feeling I'm feeling like it yeah I'm having um white wine I'm having a pinot grigio a santa margarita nice. uh it was what we had and I went for it so nice yeah, so we'll be drinking a little bit today. The uh, best for our summer cup. white. It's been really inspiring for me as your friend to watch you start your own company. I know that a few years back, you left a job at Shaw and decided to pursue um, yeah. very different things and go back and get your master's. So I was wondering if you could just start off by sort of telling your story of your journey with art. Yeah, so I always wanted to be a television host or personality but when i was a little girl there was no females there was no oprah when i was a little girl if you can believe it and mm -hmm. i remember thinking i want to be able to get on tv and tell stories and i want to be able to do it in a way that's very um you know very personal and yeah but i didn't have a lot of role models barbara walters is about the closest that i had as a role model mm -hmm. so when i went to university uh, i uh, graduated from university the year that oprah started her tv show and when I went to university to study journalism, um, I remember that the talk show world started to become really, really huge. And, and women on television telling people's stories became a very popular uh, genre. And th there was talk shows popping up everywhere, morning shows and shows at noon and shows in the afternoon all day long. You could turn on the TV any time of the day and you would see them. And so I finally kind of thought, that's kind of what I think I want to do. So when I graduated from university, I, um, I started as a writer and then I got into working in front of the camera. So I worked as a television reporter and host for uh, over 20 years. And so I told the stories of the people on Vancouver Island and my focus was lifestyles. So I mm. really focused on telling, telling, telling those lifestyles driven stories. So um, whether it was a profile of an artist or um, telling people about a new restaurant or sharing a, a farm that was growing lavender and, and turning that lavender into culinary treats. Those are the stories that I told. And I, I, the show that I produced um, and hosted just before I quit um, was on every day. So it was a new story every day. So it was, a, it was an amazing career. I was seriously, it was a dream job. And yeah. people, a lot of people ask me what I quit. Well, how did you quit? You had the best job in the world. And mm -hmm. I ate and drank a lot on TV. So people are like, all you do is eat and drink. <laughs> and well, I well cheers to that. Yeah. No, exactly, right? <laughs> so I, um, but the reason I quit was about four years ago. Well, yeah, four years ago, I saw a huge shift and people were uh, consuming media very differently. And I knew, I knew, like I knew, like I knew that if I could leave on a high, that my passion for storytelling and video and storytelling in this way would stay. Um, and I just shifted to a new, a new platform. And if I stayed in television, I would get disgruntled because I could already see that happening. There was a lot of budget cuts. They were laying a lot of people off. They were canceling a lot of shows. And I thought, I don't want to leave when I'm angry. I, I want to leave because it's been such a great ride. So that was a yeah. really good decision. I didn't get any of the big buyouts that a lot of my colleagues got because I left on my terms. But by leaving on my terms, I left on a high. They produced a, a, a farewell show for me, which mm -hmm. was just like to this day, it's, it's, I, I watch that show every so often. It's up on YouTube if anybody wants to watch it. Uh, yes, yes. Lots of clips of Charlotte as a little girl in there. <laughs> um, and uh, my daughter who was on your show, but you know, it was, it was amazing. So I decided to go back and get my master's and I started my master's while I was still working full time in TV. And then I quit just before I started my thesis. And I did my thesis uh, as a documentary on the power of local storytelling, because I knew that if we didn't continue to tell local stories, even if we were doing it differently on podcasts, on 
um, sure. digital platforms. But if we didn't continue to tell local stories, that it would impact community. But I wanted to know how, and I wanted to make sure I was right about it. So I, yeah. that was my thesis. And so I graduated with distinction. My documentary won some awards. I was able to showcase it um, at a couple of conferences. And then I started working doing media for, uh, for Victoria. So my job was to work with travel writers all over the world to tell the story of, of Victoria and Vancouver Island. So that was a fun kind of transition from, from my education. Um, it was amazing to work with travel writers uh, who, who just had literally been globally doing so many cool stories. But I, at about 10 months in, I was like, wait a minute. I'm a storyteller. Yeah. Right. And it was amazing to be on that other side, but I quickly learned that I was on the wrong side. I was like, mm, yeah, I got to get back on that side. So I quit to start my own company, my own video production company. But then just after I quit Tourism Victoria and I quit on really great notes, amazing job. I had an amazing year, um, but I just knew I needed to go and do other things. Uh, but Tourism Couch and asked me to help them out. They had just started a brand new uh, uh, destination marketing organization. And so they were just starting out and they needed some support. So I went over there for a year and I helped, um, I helped them really just get in that limelight. Like my job was to get them lots yeah. of media, lots of, so everybody knew the couch and was a place to go and drink wine and, and eat food and have experiences. And then I finally started my own video production company. So that's what I'm doing now. I, Karen Algozma Media is a, is a story driven media company and we, and we are continuing to tell stories uh, similar to what I did in TV, but now it's much more client driven. So yeah. that's my story. Something I'm hearing from you when you're talking about these things is like, there is a level of, and I think this comes from that artistic side and that storytelling side of, but being willing and able to adapt to the situation. I think that's a unique, maybe gifting or position that a lot of artists are put into where things are changing and uh, especially in the film and television world where everything is quick and, and, you know, the same camera you used two years ago is out now, we're doing something new and the platforms are kind of always ever evolving and that sort of thing. And so it just sounds like you took a look at that and you were like, okay, hey, I want to, I want to leave this place on my terms, which I love that you said that just, especially as a female, like this idea of the financial buyout could have been maybe something bigger and that just is clearly not your modus operandi because you're not looking to to be navigating by a financial decision, even though, of course, finances are real and important, but that doesn't sound like it's your main focus. And instead, it was like sort of your artistic integrity and, and doing stories that you love to tell. So with Kem, that's how we shorten it, by the way, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> So with Kem, like, what are the kinds of stories that you're telling? And do you feel like that is something that's being fulfilled now where you're able to really shine a, a limelight on those local stories, as you say? Yes, but it is, of course, so different. You know, when I worked in TV, I was able to tell people stories for free. So, you know, yeah. somebody would call me and say, my restaurant's opening. Can you do a story on me? I'm like, sure, I can and uh, it cost them a phone call or a press release. And now I'm calling people saying, I can do a story on for you, but it you know, will cost you money. So it's a very different paradigm. And to be yeah. perfectly honest, artists, lean in and listen. It has been the hardest muscle in the world to grow, the money muscle. Yeah. And, I, and, and, and I'm just, from all the research I've done and all the um, online communities that I've joined, creative communities I've joined, if you're an artist, and you're in business, you will always struggle with this. You will always struggle mm -hmm. with this. There's very few artists who are really, really comfortable with the financial side of, of their business because they're passionate. Yeah. And when you're passionate and you're creative, having to charge people, um, it's not that you don't have confidence that you're worth it, but it really can um, cause stress and anxiety for, for artists. And it's interesting because when you take like, courses on how to sell as, as a creative. They're always like, you can't be too salesy because as a creative, you're not salesy. Like if you're a creative- <laughs> Right, it's not authentic. Well, what it is is that they're saying that a lot of creatives are very embarrassed about being salesy. And they're like, you can't be embarrassed about being salesy because the fact that you're an artist means you will never be salesy. It's not in your DNA. Yeah. It's not in your DNA. It's just not who you are. So you don't have to worry about. So when you're pitching or you're sharing or you're um, 
talking to a client. You yeah. never have to worry about being creepy about money because you authentically will never show up that way. So you don't have to even worry about it. Right. So, right. so that was hard. And so the learning for me in the last year has been understanding how I can serve clients and help them and tell epic stories and make them, give them an incredible product and charge. So it's, it's yeah. been, it's been, it's been really, really challenging. And uh, I do think that we're getting there. Um, the cool thing about doing it this way instead of in TV is you can be super um, creative and autonomous. In other words, you can, you can say, why don't we try this? Mm -hmm. Whereas in TV, there's a formula. If you're working for a show, they often have a lot of boundaries, right? The show, the story has to be two minutes and 30 seconds. You need these certain graphic. It has to open with a sound up and that, like there's rules, yeah. right? Whereas when you run your own media firm, you really can do whatever you want, you know, within right. reason, working with clients, but you have a lot more creative freedom. So that's- Yeah, that collaboration with the client is up to you, not up to whoever's producing the show or whatever that might look like. Um, do you think, do you think that financially, like- I'm just curious about that and not that we'll have necessarily all the answers between the two of us, but do you think that there's something to do about like a worth value thing where people get nervous about the money or do you think they're separate issues? I think it's, it's de definitely because if, for example, yeah. if I was going to sell you, um, you know, if I was going to sell you some Mac makeup, for example, and I'm going to, you right. know, it, it's a commodity. So it's like here, here is this commodity for $25. You can have this commodity. This is what it will do for you. Um, and by the way, if you work in media, everyone needs to have, ha has to have some, some fix, Mac fix. This is, this is life changing. <laughs> Perfect. I I've seen way too many zoom calls with the shiny nose, just yeah, get a yeah. little Mac, Mac fix on your nose and you won't shine. Yeah. But, but when you're selling a creative idea, it, it, it's, it's an idea, it's an intellectual property. And I think that there's a, it's a lot more difficult as an artist to put value on that because it's very personal. Right. And I mean, I remember watching this documentary with Beyonce like years ago mm -hmm. and she was in this, this is when, before she was really famous. Um, she was just coming into her own and she was in this big room with a bunch of music producers and they had just listened to her first album and she was so nervous. Yeah. And when she left, she looked into the camera and she said, I, I feel like I can breathe for the first time in months because that album was so personal to me. I wrote all those songs myself. It was my, and if they hated it, I don't know what I was going to do. And so, but they might've hated it. Right. And that's the thing is that when you are trying to sell your ideas or your art, even though, um, with something like a video production company, you know, it's not always like, like totally like intangible. But yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's not like an original piece of art that you just created in, in isolation. I mean, you're collaborating with your client, but yeah. it is difficult because um, it's not that sort of dang on like tangible commodity. You're right. creating an experience. And so it's actually a cooler thing to sell, really. Yeah. Experiences are cooler to yeah. transact. Um, and, and in many ways, much more meaningful and life long lasting than a commodity, but it gets, I don't know, it gets, it gets wrapped up in ego and your sense of worth. And for us as storytellers, I, again, like you're saying, there's something more tangible about the practical video. You can put this on your social media for two minutes. You can do that. Or if you're a writer, there's something about here's the practical script that I'm handing over to you. Yeah. And I, I totally relate to that and have done both. But at the same time, I just feel like mostly what you're selling is potentially like, personality and the way that you're going to tell the story your your hit on the situation yeah. and i think as an actor for myself too it's always difficult because it is so intertwined with our personal being <laughs> because it it's not like we're, i'm playing the tuba and that's my external instrument it's like i'm the instrument it's me that's it you know what yeah. i mean and yeah. so Although if you were playing the tuba and that's what you did for a living, in a way you're selling your talent, your ability to manage that. Because I mean, the tuba is a great analogy because, um, you know, we, we, if you're, if you play the tuba and you've been playing the tuba all your life and you're like the best freaking tuba player in the world, right. you don't think anything of it because that's what you do. It's like, Oh, who would pay me to do this? It's right. Tuba. But I don't know how to play the tuba. I probably couldn't even lift one. Yeah. I don't know how to play the tuba. And so... <laughs> 
what, what you have to remember, whether you're an actor or a writer or a visual artist or whatever it is that you're doing, or, or maybe you just do web design. I shouldn't say just web design. Web design is amazing. But whatever mm -hmm. it is that you are, are, as a creative, you're selling, whatever commodity you're selling, it, no one can do it better than you in, in that way. You know, and it's really, you know, if I ever had to give wisdom to young artists or old artists, artists of any age, yeah. is know that it's like acting for you, Janessa, probably seems not so much easy, but like you've been acting your whole life. You, right. You know, if I said to you, okay, you know, here's a script, do it. For you, it'd be like breathing air. But for 99.9% .9 of the planet, it would be terrifying. Yeah. So just because it's easy and fun and it fills your soul up doesn't mean everyone can do it. So it's that, uh, right. that belief that what you're giving is unique and one of a kind and really, really hard for most people. So uh, one thing I find with actors, for example, I'm a video producer, so I hire actors sometimes to be in my videos and I never, ever say, can you just do it for free so that you can... This will help you with your demo reel because I want that actor to earn it. I want them to freaking like rock it. I want them to work hard. I want them to come show up prepared. I want them to um, take direction and be the best version of themselves because I know acting in my video is not easy and I have to hire someone talented who's got education and experience and chutzpah mm -hmm. and, I, and they are 100% worth their value. So I am happy to pay them. And that's a big mistake that a lot of business people make is they try to hire artists for free. Bad idea. Never hire an artist for free. You hmm. will get, it's, yeah. And never say yes. As an artist, don't say yes, unless it really is helping your reel. Like yeah. if Oprah came and said, hey, Janessa, I noticed you have a podcast and we're yeah. doing this like thing on young podcasters would we be able to include a clip? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Say yes to that. Maybe because sure. Well, because it would get your following so much higher. Of course. That of you course. know that there is value in it. But if the only value is that that person is just kind of, you know, Oh, you know, you'll get it. You can put this on your demo reel. That's not a huge value to not at this stage in your, in your, in your career. Yeah. Maybe when you were very first starting. So that's what I would say is, is it's really important for artists to understand that it may be, easy for you, but it's mm -hmm. actually an incredible gift for you to be able to do what you do. Playing the tuba, acting, producing videos. Yeah. This idea that it has to be hard in order for it to be worth it. Like, it's like if something comes natural to us, we deny that as like, oh, well, then that can't be something worth paying for. It's a very strange thing. I also think there's a bit of a confusion in it. So for example, if I went to school to learn how to code, right? So I could code. Mm -hmm. And I took like five years of university and I just like, like studied coding and I put my 10,000 hours in. So I was like the best coder in the world. I could see tricking myself and thinking, oh, well, coding's worth something. I went to school to learn to do this. Yeah. It took me years to learn how to do it. I should get paid well. But actors, singers, writers, um, video producers, it's the same. We put in our 10,000 10, hours too. So the truth is, if you haven't put in your 10,000 hours, and we all know that there are artists out there who haven't, mm -hmm. who, um, who, you know, yeah, you may, maybe you won't get paid quite yet, or you won't get paid as much because you haven't um, come to the place in your um, career where you're ready to be paid. Maybe you're still kind of somewhere in between because you do need practice. I think the only way to learn to act is like swimming on dry land. The only way to learn to swim, get in a pool. The only get way to learn water. to act, that, yeah. The, yeah, exactly. The only yeah. way to learn to act is to get on stage or get in front of a camera. And so that's why all the years you spent at university and college and, and high school on stage mm -hmm. acting for free. Well, that is your training. So yes, yeah. that was worth, worth it because you're get, you're honing your skill, sharpening your saw, learning how to do it. But once you learn how to do it, and you've got that um, 10,000, I've used 10,000 hours. I don't know. Somebody came up with that. Yeah, I think that's a book skill. actually. That's yes, Seth Rogen's book, I think, but yeah. Seth Rogen's book. But, but I mean, you know, whatever that looks like, I mean, it might not be exactly 10,000 hours, but the idea is that you're at a place in your career where you're really good at what you do. And as, and you can see the difference. I mean, Jess, I'm sure you're, you've been in a play where there's actors on that stage that have done their 10,000 hours or whatever it is. And they're just a joy to work with. They show up prepared. Mm. They understand direction. They're, um, there's just a joy to work with. And then there's actors that show up and you're like, hmm, 
hmm, sorry, I forgot my lines or I, you know, they, you know, they don't take direction well or whatever. And they're just yeah. a pain to work with. Right. So once you are there, then I think you have that, um, not just that right to ask to be paid and to be honored that way, but people will be happy to do it. And they really will because you're so good at what you do that it's seamless and quite joyful for them. So, right. you know, for example, you do a podcast. So if you had someone on your podcast who was super nervous, right? And didn't want to come on because they were like, oh, uh, mm -hmm. your job is to calm them down and yeah. with them. Totally. And so that's not easy to do. So it's, that's what I, you know. It's a skill. Yeah. It's a skill. And it's a skill that takes like a lifetime to learn and practice. And so, so then with that, people will leave that podcast experience and go, wow, that was actually so much fun, but, right. it been, but it was seamless and fun because you were steering the ship and you knew what you were doing. You were prepared. You were, yeah. So becoming a master at something, the idea of 10,000 hours, you become more of a master at something is like, I wonder if, if part of that is teaching people how to treat you too. Yeah. Yeah. Like there is a certain level that if you are showing up and you're not doing the work, people will treat you like you didn't do the work. But if you show up and you do the work, um, then I feel like when you ask for something, it's a lot easier to get behind because you can be confident that you've done the work. Like yeah. you can kind of stand on that. So it's it's just a very interesting thing because I think it is tricky for artists and, and money but we all also can't really exist without getting paid. Like in any sort of tangible, real, perpetual way, we can't continue to have a career if we're not making money on the, well, and, you know. and the best thing you can do, whether you're a, a mother of an artist or a friend of an artist, <laughs> or you love the arts, yeah. you pay for it. Yeah. You know, don't try to get free music. Don't get free videos. I mean, yeah. you, you know, I, I, I we, have, to that. <laughs> yeah, I, we have a Netflix uh, subscription and um, it's a long story, but more people were on it than should have been. Yeah. And I upgraded us. And my husband said, who upgraded the Netflix? And I said, I did. And he goes, why? And I said, because we are paying for three people on who are on it. And there's five people on it. And, um, and that's illegal. And I'm not doing it. So either tell these people to not be on our Netflix anymore or pay for it. And I, I am such a stickler about that because mm. I think that um, if we aren't willing to pay for music and, um, and movies and theater and visual arts and, and all those things, they won't, they won't survive. They just won't. I'm telling right. you. We of all people understand that we're trying to like rip things off for free. Don't, <laughs> like, man, don't. And, and it's not expensive. You know, I mean, right. when I was, when I was your age, yeah. I had to buy like a, I'd have to go and buy a cassette or a vinyl record or whatever it was. And you got like, you'd only want one song on that record and you buy the whole dang record for $14.99. I'm not joking. It was between $14 and 20 bucks 35 mm -hmm. years ago to buy an album. And it's because you wanted one song. And yeah. so now you can choose one song at a time for a buck, or if you have an Apple subscription or whatever you sure. have, you can get a million songs, but pay for it, my friends, pay for it. And, and that's the karma that will come back to you too, if people are willing to pay. Um, one thing I have to say though, and I say this with trepidation, but okay. I'm not convinced that it's also a good thing is I want to see women in Hollywood get as much as men, but I'm not convinced of the star system um, in the way it is today, um, that there are people who are making a billion dollars a movie. And I, I say that, I, 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 I have to hold my breath when I say that, because I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure about that yet. Sure. But, but I feel like we need, um, a, a just, you know, Everybody needs to get paid well to do amazing work and there should be an abundance out there because what happens when so much money is involved in a, in a movie, I'm mean, talking movies right now, is that really accountants, and this is just the truth, my friends, like it or hate it, mm -hmm. are running the show. So if they knew the Avengers made, you know, five point million dollars on day one in 2017, and they knew exactly why, you know, you need to have Thor in it or I, I don't know. I, sure. You know, Here's the formula for Here's that the formula. Money. And what happens is that when all the money goes to formulatic 
um, movies with stars in them. And I love stars. And Janessa, I hope you're a star one day and you're making a million dollars. So I, that's why I say, I say that with trepidation. I understand. Yeah. I do. I say that with trepidation because I think people should be, there's nothing wrong with being an abundant, um, wealthy, uh, successful sure. artist, right? God, like Meryl Streep, she's worth every penny. But yeah. I just think it's gotten in the way of- The art making? Yes. It can get in the way. It has gotten in the way because what's happened is this industry has become so driven by numbers mm. and that we, a lot of the smaller movies, and of course, you know, if anyone knows anything about um, distribution, right? So, yeah. you know, so you could go make a movie right now and it could be just amazing. Some of the best writing we've ever seen in the world. And it's not, if nobody, if you can't get distribution for it, which is almost impossible, unless you have the big studios behind you or the big production companies behind right. you. Right. Then no one will see it. And if you don't, and most of those companies are run by accountants. So I just think, I hope that as we, I hope the gift of the digital platform mm -hmm. is that more independence or more, more artists can have their stuff seen, um, which I think has been happening, especially with things like indie music and things like that, for sure. Right. There's more independent music than I've ever seen in my life, which is amazing but I just want to see it continue and have it financially viable. You know, I think there should be yeah. in every community. I think that there should be, and people should support them. I think that every community should have a budget for local theater. Um, I think that there should be uh, small movie houses in every, every community. And those small movie houses should have independent movies as well as regular movies. Um, yeah. I just think that we need that to support each, our, our art community in a much more tangible way. Definitely. I think we don't. I mean, there's a lot of communities where we're from where the government funding for any kind of art is not supported. So when you talk about every town, it's like some people I find that when there's any kind of financial crisis, I mean, we're thinking right now in terms of COVID and how that has affected people, people's automatic response is to shut that down, shut down art. But it's so interesting. We've been talking on the show a little bit about essential service and I totally support like I've said on the show before too I very much support doctors and nurses and everyone who's doing these practical works but I think that you know a lot of people wouldn't be making it without Netflix right now or yeah. like without something to distract them and so at what level again it seems like we're sort of what you were saying earlier about the paying for it there's like an intangibility factor around a lot of art that people are like, well, I guess we don't need it because we can just make it ourselves or something. But in reality, skillful craftsmanship of art is really important and people feel the difference and notice when it's gone. You know, it's interesting. Years ago, when I was a young reporter, there was a new theater that was built in Sydney, the little seaside town I live in just outside of Victoria. Mm -hmm. And Charlie yeah. White was, he had, Charlie White was this famous guy who had a fishing show. So I don't fish, but if you fished, everybody knew Charlie White. Yeah. And so he made like millions of dollars off this fishing show. Yeah. And because he, he did it by being sponsored by like communities, he traveled the world wow. fishing. And every time he'd go to a community that had a local theater, he said, it felt different. It's like you'd walk into this town mm -hmm. and people knew each other. They were talking to each other. There was a sense of gathering. People were connected and they always had that one common thread. They had a local theater. And so when he was in his late seventies, early eighties and knew that, you know, he wanted to leave a legacy, what did he do? He, he built a theater in Sydney. So it's called the Charlie White Theater. And wow, that is what we need. Every, every community needs a theater. And, and I would say that, you know, the theater can be multi-purpose. It can have, you know, the, the, the local dance studio um, recital in it, but it can also have a professional show and it can have something in between. So it's a place to gather. It's a place to celebrate, but community. you need to finance those, those professional gigs. And, um, and I think when you do, the, the gift back is just extraordinary. And it's not as tangible as giving money to a wing of a hospital for sure. I know, right. but, but there is something about the arts and uh, that, that gives people a, a, a sense of belonging, a sense of magic and wonder and it will allow people to survive cancer treatment and survive losing a loved one right. because they have that magic and that whimsy in their life. And without that live component, that live theater, you, you just don't have it 
for people. And so I, I, you know, part of what I, I always love doing with my video production company is doing free promos or semi free promos to help local, local small theater companies or music groups, uh, get the word out. I mean, we'd make it really simple so that it's not expensive, but I just believe so strongly in that. I think it's, I think it's the, it's, it's the fabric of every community and, and it's really dying. So many theaters have become other things. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny you're mentioning about the hospital wing. It's like, I, I think it was Lisa Kudrow from Friends uh, who plays Phoebe Buffay for people who somehow don't know that. Um, she, she was talking about, uh, I think it was sometime after the 9-11 situation happened. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, they're set in New York. They didn't really want to do too much around that theme. I think just given it was very triggering for people and obviously they shot in LA, but uh, she said people just walked up to her on the streets after that tragedy being like, thank you. Thank you for just doing this show because it just took my mind yeah. off of that, that yeah. uh, place and into something where they could breathe for a second and have yeah. some sort of respite in just and just being able to emotionally catch up to something that's so, yeah, irreconcilable. Like you just, yeah. how can you figure that out? And so well, there's I'm, a catharsism that yeah. you have when you go see a live performance. And you have yeah. it, I think, when you see a movie as well, but it's different with a live performance. It, 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 and um, I think it's that human experience, like, you know, uh, um, Brenny Brown talks about it, about mm. that need that we just, this, this deep need we have to be connected to each other. Yes. You go see a live performance. I think that that uh, need gets fulfilled, you know, yeah. on many levels. And um, you know, what's interesting to me is when I go to New York or London and you go to Broadway, I mean, you, you can't, first of all, trying to even find a ticket to a show is virtually impossible. Most of the shows are either sold out or, or close to being sold out. The tickets are ridiculously expensive. I mean, not yeah. that they're not worth it, but they just are. And so people are, are you know, second mortgaging their house to take their family to see Wicked. And yet <laughs> uh, you go to a local theater and sometimes it's half empty. And I find it so interesting that we we have this sort of love affair and rightly so with the West End and Broadway, but we forget that the magic exists just as much in local theater. I mean, mm. obviously the production level is incredibly high with those shows, but I've seen musical theater productions on Vancouver Island and in, um, in at Trinity West University, at uh, Pacific Theater, um, at the Arts Club and so on and so forth that are, I found just as, entertaining and cathartic and riveting. Yeah. And I had that same incredible butterfly goosebump moment that I did in Broadway. And so I just have, I mean, that's why I- Because it's know, human. It's a connection. Human. It's a human connection. And, yeah. and yes, of course, there's some amateur theater production. Of course. Don't have the budget to quite pull it off. But I think that's where we need to start putting money back into those kinds of things. And part of the way you can put money into it is buy season tickets. Buy season tickets to your local theater. And you know what? If, you, if there's a play that comes up and you can't make it, give it away as a gift. But mm -hmm. that's one of the greatest things you can do. Just buy those season tickets. And you know what? It's like a date night with yourself or your best friend or your loved one once every, a month or once every two months or whatever. Every year for the last 15 years, I have bought my, well, as a group, we've bought my mother and father-in-law season tickets to Shemana's Theater. And every year they're like, we're like, we're no, it's cliche. They're like, we love this is the best gift you could give us so right yeah so it's a great gift but it's a great gift to yourself you yeah know? and the yeah. same with music the same with art go see art shows go see go listen listen to local pod podcasts you know mm -hmm. really yeah the more you devour that stuff the the, the, mm. the better quality of life you're gonna have yes and and the and the more you you help these people who are so grateful and so in need of it you know totally yeah totally so you did your first two years of uh, kind of rewinding the clock here of your degree in theater and then yes. your second two in creative writing. Yeah. Um, and now you work in film and television and doing your own company, which I love. Yeah. We stand a multifaceted queen. Trust me on that. Yeah. Um, but just curious, like, why was theater not something just from hearing you talk about it? I obviously know also just from knowing you how passionate you are about it. Why was theater not something that you pursued full time? 
or what changed your mind to go into more? It's really side? simple. It's really simple. I okay. hated not having control over getting apart. <laughs> I, I kid you not. The decision was made. I auditioned for the first play. It's the first two plays for my, in my first year, got in both, got leads in both. Yeah. And then in my second year, I auditioned for a play and I didn't get a part. And I was like, really? And <laughs> it was um, at the time, because the school was so small, there was only one production per semester. So that meant I wasn't on stage for, I mean, I did theater improv and I, sure. I did some other theater stuff, but it meant I wasn't in a play for four months. So I thought, well, that doesn't work. I'm going to have to do something. So I said to the director, I said, I'll, I'll produce it or something. Like, well, what can I do? And he's like, well, you could be the house manager. This, I don't know. I was just, I was angry at all the actors for getting to act. I was mad that I had to be like organized. I was, I was like, it did not suit me. So what I realized really quickly is I do not suit not having the ability to be part of what I need to be part of all the time. So I thought if I'm a writer, I will mm. always be in control of the content. And if I'm a really, really, really good writer, then um, I'll always have work. And yeah. so I thought I can still do some acting if I want, and I can do it as a hobby or as a kind of semi-hobby, like I say that, because I wasn't really sure if I would maybe dabble in it a bit, which I did yeah. dabble in it a bit. But I thought if I'm a writer and I get into this video production thing, I will always be in charge. And I'm yeah. not saying that that's for everyone, it just wasn't for me. I am not going to sit around waiting for my agent to call me. So when I moved to Victoria from Vancouver, I got an agent. I had an agent in Vancouver too, but I was just too busy to use it. But when I moved to Victoria, I got an agent and it was quite busy. I had quite a bit of work. I did commercials. I did film and television. Um, it was all quite small potato stuff, but Victoria at the time had a fairly robust production company. We had a small sound, sound stage at the time, which we don't right now, but we did then. We mm -hmm. actually do have a small sound stage, but anyways, that doesn't matter. <laughs> side sidebar, sidebar. Sidebar, yeah. Well, because sound stages are this—that's another thing. Like Abbotsford needs a sound stage. Like, yeah, if you guys got a sound stage. You'd have film production left, right, and center. Anyways, that's it's a thing. thing. It's an important mm -hmm. thing. So, um, I, I really, I, I dabbled in it, and it was the same feeling. It's like I remember being a body double in a show, and it was just a nightmare because they, the body double's job is to do all the stuff that the actor doesn't want to do, right? So because it's cold or wet and I remember it was a murder <laughs> mystery and I was out in a boat and it was freezing and raining and the rain turned to snow and it was like hail and I'm in this boat going, this is stupid. I don't want to be a body double because body doubles actually pay really, really, really good money. Anyways, so I said to my agent, uh, Barbara Coltish, uh, I said, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And she's like, yeah, no, no problem. So that's when I, and that's when I got in television full time and I became, I was in front of the camera. So having that voice training having that ability to um, memorize scripts, because I, I never used a teleprompter, I memorized all my scripts, having that ability to speak to the camera, use your personality, use your, um, your voice and your facial expressions to be able to tell stories and work with other people was an incredible gift, so that I transferred those skills amazingly well. And yeah. I would do live theater, community theater. I did live community theater. So I, um, I had, in fact, the Charlie White Theater that I was telling you about that theater in Sydney, I was a lead in the very first play that was ever featured there. It's a play called Sylvia. And where a dog played by a human is the star of the show. It's a great play. <laughs> Anyways, so I love I, that. I, I did, I did, I, that, so it was, it, it, it suited me much more to be an actor in community theater than it did to be an actor full time. I hated the rejection. I couldn't stand it. I hated not yeah. getting the lead, like, yeah. No, I needed to be in front all the time, driving yeah. the story. And I don't know if I was that talented either, Janessa. Like, I don't think <laughs> I could put myself down. <laughs> I, I, think, like, I think I was mediocre. I think I was like a five out of 10. I don't know about that, but you know, that's you so You and Charlotte awesome. and, and, you know, the team, all the, all the team that I, I got to know uh, during the time that you were studying theater and watching you guys in productions, you were, you were much more talented than me. I mean, I was okay but I wasn't amazing. I'm much better at television, yeah. much better TV person or a video person than I am an actor. But I think it's also because you love it. That's the yeah. thing. When you can play yourself and just like have that energy, it, yeah. I think you're going to thrive and succeed wherever you feel like this best suits me. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? It just kind of clicks. Well, and I think at the heart of who I am is I'm a storyteller. Like if you, mm -hmm. if I just say in one word, who am I? I? I'm a storyteller. I am passionate about telling people stories. And what I'm really, really passionate about 
is learning about your story and finding out why you love what you do and then sharing that with the world in a way that's inspiring, which is very much what you're doing with this podcast. Because when you hear someone else's story and you hear that ever since they were, you know, five years old, they were fascinated by birds and then they go on to become, you know, one of the most famous sort of bird watching gurus in the world. Of the world. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'm telling you, my friend, like, I'll give you an example of a weird, like weird, weird passions. When you work in TV, you interview everybody. I interviewed so many interesting people who, who were absolutely gifted and passionate at the strangest things, which were my favorite, because it makes you realize how unique everyone is. Like I interviewed this guy who painted oil paintings for dollhouses and he sold those paintings this big, this big, $3,000 because he was the best dollhouse oil painter (sighs) in the world and people would collect his stuff who collected dollhouses. Now you and I don't collect dollhouses, but people who do it, they're passionate about it. Mm. It's their thing, it's their, it's what they do in all their spare time, it's where they spend all their money. And so, um, you know, when you meet, uh, anytime you meet somebody who loves what they do, as weird and wild as it is, you get to know that heart of what they do. And once you learn that and that comes out in an interview and you share that with the world, everybody's inspired by it. It's infectious. Yeah. It's yeah. infectious. And it makes you just be sort of, you know, it reminds you as a human that we all have purpose and we all have a gift and we all have something unique that we ha- could offer to the world and yeah. to trust that. Even if it feels vulnerable at times, I think it's very vulnerable to be an artist. We talked about this in the beginning of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it is what you know makes your heart skip a beat, then you belong there. That's it. Yeah. It's just as simple as that. That was the first part of the two-part episode of Conversations with Karen. I hope that you guys enjoyed that first half, and we will see you back here next week for part two. Bye!